أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أفضل الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما ورزقني فهما أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته it brings me great pleasure to welcome you back to the fourth and final installment of the Back to Basics series. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten us through it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you and me to benefit from this and from mastering the basics. And so let's dive straight in for this week. And we hope inshallah to gain the maximum benefit. And this is one of the most important topics that we will be talking about and that is the topic of ihsan now as you know in the in the first installment we covered the sources of al-islam and where do we take our islam from and then we covered the hadith of an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam which is known as the famous hadith of jibril alayhi salam and in that hadith we said that islam is in three categories those three categories are Iman, which is your belief system. And we covered that in the second, cha- in the second uh, chapter of the series. Then in the third chapter of the series, we covered the understandings of the different schools as that sometimes becomes a problem in fiqh. And now, inshallah, we will wrap the series up with discussing Ihsan. We discussed Islam, Iman, and now we want to discuss Ihsan, which is the science of spiritual excellence and so now that we look at the science of ihsan and we need to understand where does it come from and as we said our sources are the quran and the authentic sunnah so therefore let us look to the quran to see what it says about the science of ihsan ihsan as we know we are going to translate it as we mentioned as spiritual excellence or having that spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in Surah Shams. وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها. Now the reason I read this entire portion is that in this surah, this is the longest oath Allah subhanahu wa taala has ever taken in the entire Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the wow here, for those of you who know, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying by the sun and its brightness or when it, when it comes up during the dawn. وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا And by the moon when it follows it, the sun. And by the day when it displays it. وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَخْشَاهَا And by the night when it covers the day. وَالْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا And by the sky and he who constructed it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا And by the earth and he who spread it. وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath by the soul and he who apportioned it. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath by our souls and He is telling us He apportioned it for us. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And inspired it with wickedness or righteousness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can inspire your soul with wickedness or righteousness, good or bad. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, after this entire Long oath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sworn, now taken an oath by the greatest and biggest signs we know. Do we know any greater signs than 
the shams, then the sun, then the qamar, which is the moon? Do we know any greater signs than the day and the night, which control our daily lives? Do we know any greater signs than the skies or than the earth, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for us? And do we know of any other mystery but the soul? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِنَا That the soul is from the affairs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever He only told us, we should know about. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَهَا مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Surely he who purifies his soul is successful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And whoever... Uh, whoever fails to instill this uh, righteousness will end up in corruption. Right? He, uh, let me read you the entire translation, and he has failed who instills with it corruption. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, this is how you are successful. You want to be successful in this life? قَدْ أَفْلَهَا مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Purify yourself. So we have this from Al-Qur'an. Al-Qur'an calls this tazkiyah. The science of self-purification, the science of ihsan. Al-Qur'an tells us it's tazkiyah. And the hadith tells us ihsan. It's one in the same. Purification of the heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now also says in Surah Mulk, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الْأَفْوَنِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ That glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who possesses all things and has power over everything. Right? Everything is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kingdom. And after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us his power, he is telling us that he's in control of everything. What does he tell us subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why he created us. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created life and death to test you. Which one of you will be the Best of deeds. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ahsanu amala, you are to do the best of deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, Akhtharu amala, that you should do the most deeds. So we see it's quanti- a quality over quantity. Ahsanu amala, the best of deeds. And that's why in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so now we need to ask, we need to ask ourselves, how do we do this tazkiyah? How do we purify our hearts? We have to go to Al-Quran again as always. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, قَدْ أَفْلَهَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ فَصَلَّى Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in another surah, قَدْ أَفْلَهَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى Surely he who purifies himself, who purifies his heart is successful. And now, we have to ask ourselves, how do we do this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the way to purify ourselves in the very next or in the very uh, next words of this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَهَ مَنْ And then he says, وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ فَصَلَّى And whoever makes dhikr of Allah, remembrance of Allah, and he establishes his prayer. That's it. You want to purify yourself, have the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and establish your prayer. And that remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that prayer, many prophets before us, if not all the prophets, were ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship Him that way. And we have few similarities elsewhere. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us here that if you want to purify yourself, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all know how to do dhikr. Whether you even say la ilaha illallah, that's dhikr. 
And dhikr is an extremely important key to unlocking the secrets of tazkiyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, udhkuru Allah dhikran kathira. That, O oh you who believe, make much remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do remembrance, kathira. That means a lot. There is no limit. Just make your remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ayah doesn't tell you how, nor how many, nor a specific time. It just says, make dhikr of Allah as much as you can. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us why we should make dhikr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al qulub That surely with the dhikr or the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do hearts find tranquility. They find peace. We all want happiness in our lives. We all want peace in our lives. We need to make that remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that our hearts can find ease, so that our hearts can find peace. That's the whole idea of tazkiyah, bringing your heart closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you bring your heart closer to its maker, then you are bringing your heart to ease. Because as we always like to say, that the invention or the created is always better off with its creator. So, let's talk about the basics on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about tazkiyah, we always talk about the path. Because tazkiyah is a spiritual journey. It's an experiential journey. And therefore, when you want to walk this path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to know the basics of how to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone tells you, I want to travel to the USA or I want to travel to Japan or to Europe, you need to know how to get there. You need to know if you want to go from one city to another, what's the route? And so each school will tell you to practice what you learn in slow increments and in slow dosages. These are what we call the Sufi orders or the schools of Tasawwuf. Tasawwuf means exactly the same thing. It means to purify yourself, to purify your heart. Similarly to Tazkiyah or Ihsan. We have usually in each Sufi order, let's break it down, let's understand how they work. <clears throat> so, in each Sufi order, you will have the Sheikh. He is the leader of this order and he is like the doctor. So, when you have a disease in your body, you need to go to the doctor to find out the cure. He will give you the medicine, you will take the medicine, and you will be cured. Similarly, if you want to cure the diseases of the heart, the spiritual heart also has diseases. And if you want to cure them, you have to find the doctor. And the sheikh is your spiritual doctor. He is the one who will give you the medicine. He is the one who will diagnose you. Because it's not just as simple as reading books and trying to self-diagnose, right? Anyone will tell you that you can't just go on WebMD uh, and just try and to diagnose yourself if you are sick. Similarly, you cannot open a book of Tazkiyah and try to self-diagnose yourself. To be able to try and tell yourself or tell your own symptoms when you've never seen or you don't know of these symptoms. So therefore we have the Sheikh. And he will be your guide on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will point you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to himself. Let's get this straight, that anyone who points you to himself is not taking you to Allah. But anyone who pushes you towards Allah and leaves off themselves, that is the true sheikh. So that's the first part. The second part is we have the wird. The wird or the daily or weekly awrad is a litany of certain du'as or certain dhikr as we mentioned. Remember dhikr is, a, is an extremely important integral of cleansing yourself. So this wird or daily or weekly litany will consist of 
dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will be prescribed to you simply to be able to help you on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will be a facilitator for you to be able to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And usually, these are all from the Qur'an. So usually the three main dhikrs which you will be prescribed, remembrances of Allah, is the istighfar, seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next thing is you will be prescribed the tahleel or praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like la ilaha illallah or the tahmeed, alhamdulillah or subhanallah, which any, any of these things, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the third you will be prescribed is the salawat or durood upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And these all come from Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders people to make istighfar and to do tawbah in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders people, he says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That know that there is no deity uh, worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Muhammad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels make and send their salah and salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam and then Allah commands you that O oh, you who believe send your salawat upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam right it's a command from Allah so therefore these dhikrs come from the Qur'an. You have to make the Qur'an your basis for anything and everything. The Qur'an and Sunnah are your basis to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And next we have the silsila. The silsila literally means, silsila means a chain, right? Like a metal chain. And usually the silsila of a Sufi order is really important. Because it shows that this order is legitimate. Because this is a chain of narration. So the sheikh would have learned from his sheikh. Who would have learned from his sheikh all the way going back. And all Sufi orders, all spiritual purification orders go back to Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. Karramallahu ta'ala wajha. So they all go back to Sayyidina Ali. All and every single one of them go back to him. They all learn from him. And so he goes and takes his knowledge. Sayyidina Ali takes his knowledge, knowledge from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam took his knowledge from Jibreel alayhi salam who took it directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes Rasulullah took it directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. So therefore, this chain goes back all the way. So you know you have taken your spiritual purification and the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by those who have traveled the path and those who have reached the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is from the Qur'an. I mean, this is from the hadith. Where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمُ That surely learning is... By teaching or seeking knowledge, gaining knowledge is from teaching. It's not necessarily in books. You can read all the books you want. But if you do not have a teacher who has sat in front of a teacher, who has sat in front of a teacher, all the way back going to someone who has sat in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, then your learning will be cut off from the barakah. It will be cut off from the traditional way in which Islam has preserved its, its knowledge. And that's really important. And that's why you will hear many scholars, they quote this hadith to the famous Tabi'i Malik ibn Dinar. And some even attribute it to Ibn Sirin. But Imam Muslim in his uh, muqaddima, in his introduction, he attributes it to Malik ibn Dinar where he says, uh, Al-Isnad min al-Din, falawla al-Isnad laqala man sha ma sha. That this chain of narration is from religion. And if it wasn't for this chain, 
then anyone could say whatever they wanted to. Right? So, therefore, realize, my dear brothers and sisters, you need to travel the path with those who are qualified. You need to be connected to those. And look at how you are connected to the awliya in all the chains. You will be connected if you join the Qadri order to Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jailani. You will be connected to Sheikh Ahmad al-Rifari. You can be connected to Sayyidina Mu'ainuddin Chisti. And all of these great people. And even better yet, you will be connected to the Ahlul Bayt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That is Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Al-Hasan wal Hussein, And you will be connected even more to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam himself. In this journey, in this chain of narration. So those are the main things which every... Uh, as we call them tariqa or silsila or zawiya or sufi order whatever you want to call it those are the main integrals and the beginner's path on all of these schools always starts with something very simple and very easy every single school when you enter into it they will all tell you one thing you got to make tawbah tawbah means to turn back or Go back, linguistically. But when we talk about the shara'i meaning, we talk about turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawbah means returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spiritually and doing a metaphorical turning back away from your sins and towards Allah. And that is the start of the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that again is from the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah you hibbut tawabin wa you hibbul mutatahirin. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the person who does tawbah, who turns back to Him. And He loves the pure, the people who purify themselves, or the people who are physically clean, mutatahirin, tahara. And in every Sufi order, or in every spiritual order you will always be required to constantly be in a state of repentance to constantly be in a state of turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for if you do not turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you have lost the journey completely you have to be journeying to Allah and any deviation you gotta turn back to Allah and we all know we make mistakes that's why we have to keep on turning back and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that we have these mistakes. It's not about the mistake. Allah knows you will make mistakes. But what, it is, what is it about? It is about the fact that you keep on turning back towards Him. We have to understand what was the difference between Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam who, was, who became a prophet, who was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus Shaytan who became the cursed one and thrown out of Jannah. The cursed one by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was the difference? Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam realized his mistake and he turned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And shaitan would not admit his mistake, would not admit his disobedience and therefore he had arrogance and pride in him and would not turn back to Allah. It's very simple. You have to keep on going back to Allah. That's the idea. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see who will return to Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in any case, we are going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Al-Quran, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. That surely we are from Allah and to Him we will return. So therefore, you can return as a good human being, someone who has a polished heart, or you can be someone who is a bad human being, and you can be amongst those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be pleased with. And then the next step in seeking the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to seek knowledge of what you need to know in order to complete your worship. So you need to know how to complete the Fard Salah, you need to know how to complete your Siyam. We are coming into Ramadan now, so you must know how to fast. You must know how to give Zakah if you are able and to go for Hajj if you are able. But on these paths, 
you must know how to beautify these deeds. For you see, if you have deeds and you do not beautify them, but only focus on the outside. It's like when we talk about people sometimes. They are beautiful on the outside and some people are not on the inside, unfortunately. We want to rather be beautiful on the inside. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the tongue of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at your outer appearance or your form, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your heart. So therefore, the same way your actions, if they are only on the outside, solid. So if you make your salah according to all the correct fiqh, and if you do your salah perfectly according to fiqh, but on the inside there is no concentration, on the inside there is no, uh, uh, how do we say, there is no muhasaba, you are not witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the inside if there is no khushu' concentration with Allah, then is your salah really worthy of acceptance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is something we need to understand. If you do your actions according to what is only valid, then why should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept your, dua, uh, your, your worship? Why should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your worship when you did not put in any extra effort, but only wanted to make it valid? Valid does not mean accepted, my dear brothers. So understand that if you want your uh, salah and your siyam and your zakah and your hajj to be accepted, you have to beautify it. You got to learn how to do it perfectly. That is the understanding of ihsan. Ihsan is when you learn to perfect your deeds and perfect your iman. That is spiritual excellence. And ihsan, its linguistic meaning, means excellence. It means striving for perfection. So if you truly want ihsan, you got to do your deeds properly. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam tells us in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that he who fasts but speaks bad, speaks qawl al-zur and then acts upon it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of his fasting from drink and fasting from food and fasting from intimacy. Allah doesn't need that. But yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the opportunity to do these things correctly. So are you doing them correctly? Are you going to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with deeds that are beautified on the inside so that they can be worthy of acceptance? Your worship may be valid but may not be accepted. But if you beautify them, and if you do them solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it may be accepted by Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows of the acceptance. And then the next thing we go to when we want to understand what we should be doing in these orders. The next thing we have is khalwa. Khalwa means to seclude yourself. And in your seclusion, when you are away from everything this world has to offer, when you are away from the distractions of this world, can you truly find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that means what? That means that when you go into seclusion, you are now following in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. When he went into the seclusion, into the cave of Hira, he went into the cave of Hira and there he found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who revealed to him the first ayat, Iqra, read. And only through that seclusion did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come to an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam with the revelation. And so these are some basics which every uh, spiritual order or every school of tazkiyah will teach you. But we need to answer one very common question. And we need to understand a few things. We need to answer something that comes up a lot. Do I need to join a Sufi order? And do I need to give pledge of allegiance to a Sheikh? The answer is no. That it is not obligatory upon you to join any of these Sufi orders. It's not obligatory upon you to 
to take one share in the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is obligatory upon you is ihsan. What is obligatory upon you is spiritual excellence. That is from the Quran. That is from the Sunnah. These spiritual schools are not, from, are not necessarily ordained by the Quran and Sunnah. Yet all their practices lie in Quran and Sunnah. Right? So therefore, what is obligatory upon you is to polish your character. The old, in the old days, in the first 300 years after Hijrah, the people of Tazkiyah, the people who were closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the awliya, they used to say that all of Tazkiyah, all of Ihsan, is simply good character. If you have good character, you will have everything. You will be traveling the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot be a good muhsin. You can be someone who has good ihsan. You can't be someone who has uh, who is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are not a good human being. You can't be a good Muslim if you are not a good human being. You have to be good to everyone. You have to be righteous to everyone. And you cannot be a good Muslim without being a good human being. It's very simple. And that's why we bring the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam again, where he asked, Jibreel alayhi salam asked, Ya Rasulullah or Ya Muhammad, tell me about Ihsan. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Ihsan an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tara, fa illam takun tarahu fa innahu yarak. That Ihsan, spiritual excellence, is that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see him. And if not, know that he sees you. Know, my dear brothers and sisters, that the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by worshipping him and by staying away from all that displeases him subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is very simple. That is what is obligatory upon you. That is the way to taqwa. That is the way to total transparency with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you don't have that, then you need to check yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala checks you. You need to weigh up your life before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala weighs up your life before you. You need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed excellence upon everything. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam tells us in an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, that he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ الْإِحْسَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ إِذَا ذَبَحْتُمْ فَأَحْسَنُ الذبح. That surely Allah has prescribed upon everyone excellence. إِحْسَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed excellence in everything that you do. So if you are going to slaughter, as the hadith tells us, do the best of slaughtering. And similarly, if you are going to do these actions of worship, do the best of actions. If you are going to seek knowledge, seek the best of knowledge. Do the best and be the best at what you are. Be the best for the sake of Allah, not for anyone else. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Are you going to worship Allah the way He wants you to worship Him? Or are you going to be like those who want to worship Allah the way they want? And that is a form of arrogance. Trying to tell Allah that we know better how to worship Him. When He is our creator, He is our sustainer and He is not in need of us. He is not in need of anything for anything. Yet everything is in need of Him for everything. That should make us think should make us realize, are we of those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way Allah wants us to worship Him? And that brings us to the next question. The next very famous question which comes up is that, do I need a sheikh? Do I need someone to take me on this path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And yes, if you need to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or if you want to travel the path, you need a guide. And generally, it is not within most of our capabilities to access that guidance. Although that guidance is there in Al-Quran, the guidance is there in the Sunnah. But oftentimes, we will find people getting confused and people 
who do not understand the path. And that's why we have teachers and guides and shuyukh because they have traveled the path and they know the path well. Similarly, if you want to travel, as we mentioned, if you want to travel from a city to another city, you do not have GPS. It's back in the old days now. Let's say you are traveling in the desert, no internet signal. You need a guide to take you through the desert or else you will be lost. You will be lost in this endless ocean of sand and you will not find your way to Allah. But what type of sheikh does someone need? And does someone need to pledge their allegiance to the sheikh? That's what we need to answer. So someone needs a sheikh who can teach you the proper understanding and the proper, proper method of seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the basics of knowledge and these basics that we have been talking about. One does not need to seek out the best of the best. One does not need to seek out uh, people who will be far away. Your local scholar is just as good. Your local scholar can give you the basics on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your local imam. And if you want to take the pledge of allegiance with a sheikh, that's even better for you. I'm not saying it's bad in any way. It's better for you. It's optional. And these orders of Sufi schools or these orders of schools of Tazkiyah, they are simply better for you. They are for those who want to dedicate a portion of their lives to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how small or how big. They are for those who want to do extra, who want to be extra special, who want to become among the elite of the elite, who want to become among those who only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him, who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unconditionally. Those are the people we should be striving to become. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, قَدْ أَفْلَهَا مَنْ It's that simple. You want to succeed in life? Do tazkiyah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also teaches us one thing as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is important, وَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ And do not think that you have purified yourself. Do not say, I have now purified myself. For the moment you have that arrogance, that pride, that I have now purified myself, you will start all over from the beginning. No one is better than no one, except in matters of taqwa. And he who has taqwa has less pride. So therefore, the number one golden rule in tazkiyah is that do not think you are better than anyone. You are only better than someone when you have more taqwa. And that taqwa will remove the pride from you anyway, so you will not think that you are better than anyone. It was asked to Imam Ahmad al-Rifai al-Kabir, the great wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who was known as Sahib al-Karama. He had so many extraordinary uh, miracles karamat of Allah that was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor him. He had so many of them that he became known as Sahibul Karama, the friend or the one who Karama would accompany him. And it was asked to him that who is better than you? And he would say, anyone who is older than me is better than me. And they asked him why? He said, that they have lived longer than me and they have had more time to worship more than me. So therefore they are better than me. And they asked him, those who are younger than you? And he says, those who are younger than me are also better than me. And they asked him, why? And he says, because they have lived less than me and they have had less time to sin. So they have sinned less than me. So therefore they are better than me. So this is how the awliya think. This is how the awliya express their love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how the awliya, those who are the close friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are to him. Why? Because they do not like pride. They do not like arrogance. And another great wali and a great leader 
of one of the Sufi orders, Sheikh Abu Hassan al Shadili, Imam Abu Hassan al Shadili. He was the Imam or the founder of the Shadili school of Tasawwuf or Tazkiyah. And he would say, Amongst the blessings I received from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that I did not get recognized for my work. Why is that? We see so many people become famous today and because of that fame, they are not able to carry out what they used to do in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is not a judgment, but from some people that tell us when they become famous, it's difficult. They have to be able to provide for people. They have to be able to provide guidance and give people their time. But Abu Hassan al shadili he says, I did not become famous for what I used to do. Therefore, he could always be in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would not be scared that pride would enter if he became famous. For if you ask many famous shuyukh today, they will say that they are scared sometimes for that fame can lead to arrogance, it can lead to pride. If you do not check yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may just check you. So, these are some of the basics on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope, my dear brothers and sisters, that this may be beneficial for you. I hope, my dear brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us from strength to strength, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to gain closeness to Him, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us amongst His special creation, amongst His special awliya that have treaded the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that have struggled on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that we may come to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day with a clean heart, that we may come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment with a smiling face knowing that we worshipped Him and that we have made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy with us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, is pleased with what we have done. And that brings me to the last part. You have to sacrifice. If you do not sacrifice what you want for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, you can never tread the path to Allah. Unfortunately. And that is a sad reality. Nothing comes without sacrifice. Sacrifice what you want for what Allah wants. If you want Anything that is of disobedience, sacrifice it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you good for that. He will give you the best for that. Try it, my dear brothers and sisters. Just try it. And you will see the beauty. You will see the veils being lifted from you. And you will be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the only thing that veils you is your lack of sacrificing your sins. Sacrifice your sins and do the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He will bring you into His presence. For surely, one who wants to be in the, pre be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot go with a heart that is full of sins. How can something that is impure be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is pure and only accepts the pure? The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. It tells us, Inna Allah tayyib la yaqbalu illa tayyib. That Allah subhanahu, is ta subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and He only accepts the pure deeds. So sacrifice. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your energy. Sacrifice your life if you can. By that I don't mean go get killed, but sacrifice your entire being and all your time. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that way you will come closer to Him. And that way your heart will find ease. Your heart will find contentment. That's the whole idea of this journey. That's the whole idea of coming closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As it is said, Kun fi dunya ka gharib. Be in this world like you are a traveler. Travelers do not take much with them when they travel. They do not... Hold on to their baggage. They are just passing by. Be like someone who is passing by in this world. If you accumulate this world, how are you going to travel on that journey and go to your destination, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Sacrifice this world. Sacrifice all your possessions 
so that you can travel lighter. You want to travel light or you want to travel heavy? The dunya will weigh you down. Your possessions will weigh you down. But if you sacrifice them, it will take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that, my dear brothers and sisters, it brings us to an end of a wonderful uh, series. And it brings me uh, great sadness to be able to leave you. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all to his path. And I can only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the mercy and bestow us with the mercy of being able to sacrifice for him, being able to come closer to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that, I bid you farewell and I ask again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us love for each other and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us on the day of Qiyamah in front of him where we will be drinking from the blessed hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and entering Jannah with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Fassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.